Professor. Nice speaking with you. Great. Let's talk a little bit about this bill, uh, because uh, the concern of civil libertarians is that the bill is going to put a crimp in the Fourth and Eighth Amendments. We primarily talked about the Eighth Amendment with Congressman Dornan. Uh, let's talk about the illegal search and seizure provisions and whether it's going to affect uh, folks' uh, basic uh, rights in this country, from your point of view. Well, Tom, let me, let me first say that um, I, I have uh, very high regard for Professor Shimerinsky and the efforts to ensure that we are not going to in any way violate the rights of even convicted felons. I believe that we need to recognize their constitutional rights. But I will say that uh, while it's important that we protect those, I myself am very concerned um, about critics of this legislation, which I happen to believe is very balanced in addressing the concerns of both the Fourth and the Eighth Amendments to the Constitution. Uh, really, you know, we're, we're really not talking about innocent um, till proven guilty uh, victims here we're talking about convicted felons number one and number two when it comes to the issue of search and seizure there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the supreme court decision that was uh, led by uh, justice rehnquist in 1983 in the illinois versus gates case addresses the good faith aspect of the fourth amendment and uh, I will tell you that I believe very strongly that what we're trying to do with this bill moves us in a positive direction. But we've got to remember that the issue here is really an emergency situation. And I would certainly agree with what I'm sure Professor Shimerinsky would say and others, that in an emergency situation, you must be even more careful than you might in other situations. And I believe that very strongly. But because we have... Uh, violent crime occurring every 20 seconds, and there's no reason for, my to, for me to go through the litany. You know them all, Tom, very well. The fact of the matter is, I believe that we have extraordinary circumstances here which do need to be addressed, and I think this bill does take us a long way towards addressing them. And let me say this, too. I think that Professor Shimerisky knows full well that conversations like this can help us as we begin amending the bill and modifying it, and it's quite possible that we could come up with satisfactory legislation which could address the concerns that the American Civil Liberties Union has and others. Congressman, you and I certainly agree there's a serious drug problem, and I agree with your commitment to the Constitution. But the bill does spend many important constitutional rights. The Supreme Court has said that the Constitution requires the suppression and evidence of illegally obtained material. In the case that you referred to, Gates says, if a magistrate in good faith issues a warrant illegally, the evidence can nonetheless be admitted. This bill goes far beyond that. This bill, bill says that if a police officer in good faith makes a mistake and violates somebody's rights, the evidence can still be obtained. And the well, Supreme Court has indicated that violates the Constitution. In fact, that gives police officers an incentive to lie after the fact, to make up good faith. It also gives police officers every incentive to be ignorant so they can say they were acting in good faith. Well, me... And I don't believe that we will. And I believe that if it does go too far, that the courts will make the determination that it has gone too far. But, Congressman, you take an oath of office to uphold the Constitution. And to draft a bill that would suspend, as we talked about last half hour, parts of the Eighth Amendment, or to draft a bill that would suspend the exclusionary rule and create an unconstitutional good faith exception, seems to me blatantly inconsistent with your oath of office. Well, uh, that's your interpretation of it. I happen to think that, yes, I do interpret things a little differently than you have in this case, and I am looking at a very important problem which is uh, addressed in the National Drug and Crime Emergency Act, which is exactly what this thing is called. And so, uh, you know, that's what the process is all about, and I'm not in any way questioning your uh, position as far as raising these issues, but what I am saying is that I do believe that as we look at the Eighth and Fourth Amendments, the Constitution, uh, from my perspective, we don't waive those rights, and I don't believe that even if this bill itself does go further in the direction that you're uh, referring to, that we will have a much better chance of seeing the Supreme Court make that determination than for you and me. And, of course, I don't want to see them waived at this point. All right, we'll continue our conversation coming up. Your call's coming up as well. Stay tuned. 345.
Uh, we continue with Erwin Shemarinsky, who is a professor of law at USC, member of the board of directors of the Southern California ACLU. Congressman David Dreyer from the 33rd District, a Republican. We're talking about this bill called H.R. 4079. And we continue with Mike on KFI. Hello. Hi, Tom. Good afternoon, uh, Congressman Dreyer. Michael, how are you? Professor Shemarinsky. Uh, Tom, really quickly, I have uh, uh, several problems with this, starting back with Congressman Dorman. I'd like to go up to Congressman Dreyer now that he's your guest. All right. Congressman Dreyer, could you tell me something about H.R. Bill 5210? Uh, H.R. 5210. Correct. H.R. Uh, 5210 is another bill which is along the same line of 4079, mm -hmm. uh, which is also concerned with taking away Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights of Americans. Um, let me ask you this, uh, Congressman Dreyer. Have you ever read a fantastic book called the Federalist Papers? Oh, uh, yes, I studied the Federalist Papers, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, right. all through college. Okay, then you are also familiar with a quote from James Madison who says uh, something along the line that he would uh, have all Americans in the future beware because it is a true tyrant who will take any given situation and create a crisis from the situation where a true crisis does not exist mm -hmm. to control the people and to maintain total power. You think that's what's happening here? Well, let me tell you something. Uh, Mr. Dornan just slammed uh, Colonel Bogreitz, uh, who was for 10 years uh, a member of ISA. Are you familiar with ISA? Right. Okay. Uh, could you tell me what that stands for? Uh, it's the... Uh, it, he, Bogreitz has led the charge dealing with security and... Right, but the, could you tell me what ISA stands for? Uh, I can't remember. Okay. Uh, the ISA is Intelligence Support Activities, which is basically the enforcement arm of the NSC, which is a small and... It goes on and we get in a bigger argument than that, but uh, my point is this. If you've got your elected people in your government that can't tell you what the Intelligence Support Activities Unit does, can't tell you what the Yellow Fruit Group does, can't tell you what the Sea Spray Units does, can't probably tell you what the, what the initials of SOD stand for and what they've meant, especially in the past six years, you've got severe problems with a non-representative government. Uh, 4079, luckily, and I, I want to say, by the way, too, I'm not real fond of the fact I have never, usually that I know of at, at least, had to openly defend the ACLU. Uh, but uh, at least that we all do something once in our lives, and I guess that was mine. Um, 4079 then turned into H.R. 1400. I'm just going to mention it quickly because this one suffered defeat as well. But again, they're making references to the former Bill 4079, and the interesting thing about it is they've taken out the text of the bill and they've just put in the reference point to the former bill. <laughs> now, if you're going through this as a congressman or a senator that has 15, 30, 40, 50 meetings a day, uh, we have a friend that went up to uh, Rohrbacher and said, why did you vote this way on this particular thing? And he said, quite frankly, I owed it to a friend. Uh, I don't, probably don't need to tell you who Rohrbacher is, and I probably don't need to tell you that that's how quite a few of our elected officials vote, but uh, nevertheless, I'm not going to go into it. I urge you to look into it. It's H.R. 1400, uh, 101st Congress, let's see, March 12th, 1991. It then got turned into, and this is the newest one, 102nd Congress, first session, Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1991. This calls for the establishment of such things as a new intelligence agency, uh, an ec a criminal economic terrorist task force, domestic economic criminal terrorist task force. Uh, well, the interesting thing here is, let me give you uh, the list of who will be on the board. The Economic Terrorism Task Force, Establishment and Purpose. There is established an Economic Terrorism Task Force to assess the threat of terrorist actions directed against the United States economy domestically, including actions directed against the United States government and actions against United States business interests. As, assess the ad, uh, clause two, assess the adequacy of existing policies and procedures designed to prevent terrorist actions directed against the United States economy and 
recommended administrative and legislative actions to prevent terrorist actions directed against the United States economy. Membership. Now here's what you want to take notes on very quickly. The Economic Terrorism Task Force shall be chaired by the Secretary, Secretary of State or his designee and consist of the following members. Number one, Director of Central Intelligence Agency. Number two, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Number three, Director of United States Secret Service. Number four, and this is a strange one, the Administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration. Five, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. Six, the Under Secretary of the Treasury for Finance. And seven, such other members as the Departments of Defense, Justice, State, and Treasury, or any other agency of the United States government as the Secretary of State may designate. Now, if we go on in this bill, by the way, let me tell you something. It's very difficult to get a copy of 3371. At the top of this, it says that the task force and information herein will remain classified. This is your government of the people, for the people, by the people. An unclassified version shall be prepared for public distribution at a later date. Uh, this is the text. Now let me give you a clue. If you call for 3371, everybody is going to tell you they can't get it. There's a back door way in. Uh, what we would like you to do, if you're interested, we urge you to do this. It was initiated by Mr. Jack Brooks from the Committee on Conference submitting the following conference report to accompany H.R. 3371. So ask for the conference report on this bill. Now, 3371 is currently in stalemate. It's probably not going to make it, but at the same time, it could be passed along with one of these bulldozed passages that goes through at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you're just not sure exactly. Um, the problem is nobody's doing anything. Well, I shouldn't say that. There are people that are doing something to try to put a stop to this. When Mr. Major Dean, excuse me, got up here and said earlier that he's going to violate national security acts, I don't agree with that. I think the people that are in government right now, for the most part, are violating national security acts. Uh, the problem is it's a matter of interpretation, as Congressman Dreyer said what we interpret to be criminal, and what they interpret to be criminal. Some of you may have heard of this. I don't know if you listened to Chuck Harder or uh, anybody else, but uh, this is known as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. This is now law. Well, it, it, it's been ratified, which means basically it has been adapted by the United States. It's a United Nations Pact and Covenant uh, I don't want to get into this because it's very lengthy, it sounds wonderful, but if you look into the text of what this does, it does everything that these that I've put down here on the table, everything that they've done and more. Uh, now the government's trying to make it hard for you to get this too, so I'm going to give you a method to do it. Because we've heard a lot of people say it's impossible, we can't get it. So I urge you to take this down, get the documents and read through them. You need to address your letter to the Senate Document Room, Hart Office Building, B-04, Washington, D.C., 20510. The thing you need to request is exactly the name, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Believe me, if you say covenant in Washington these days, they're going to know exactly what you're talking about. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Senate Document Room, Hart Office Building, Hart, H-A-R-T, B-04, Washington, D.C., 20510. What you need to ask for is the name of the document and then add to that Executive C, comma, D, comma, E, comma, and F. C, D, E, and F with executive in front of it. 95th Congress, second session. 
and Executive Report 102-23. Enclose that with a self-address self stamped envelope and they will return it to you very quickly within 10 days. CD and E and F. If you come up here afterwards, we'll give it to you again. Uh, that's the problem that we have going on here, uh, among others. And it's a problem that is going to have to be stopped. The only way that this can be done is if we start paying more attention to what's happening every day. Um, there's been things happening every day uh, that have been going on in the government, and nobody seems to be paying attention. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court, as you may have known just two weeks ago, ruled that the United States may hunt down, capture, and bring back foreigners from any other country, regardless of whether or not the host country has allowed this seizure to take place, regardless of any pre-existing extradition treaties with that country. It was done on June 15, 1992. We have appointed ourselves policemen of the world. Uh, everybody here, I'm sure, is familiar with what is known as the Bilderberg Group. Okay. Uh, as you can imagine, the Bilderbergs have a lot of security. As you can probably also imagine, uh, some of these security people have problems with some of the things that go on. They can't hire all of their friends. I want to give you a quote from Henry Kissinger a quote that he made at the Bilderberg meeting that, interestingly enough, and I, I hate to quote it, but I'm going to, it was the Spotlight magazine. And they included just the first <laughs> sentence and then stopped. Now, I want to say right here and now, I do not endorse the Stoplight magazine. Uh, I've got severe problems with it. Uh, the former director, uh, Willis Cardo, whatever his name was, they used to start off the meetings of the Spotlight by standing in allegiance and singing the Horst Vessel song. Not the Spotlight, excuse me, Liberty Lobby, which produces the Spotlight. The Horst Vessel song was the original song of Hitler's Green Army. It was also the song of uh, the Third Reich in Germany when they first came to power. One of the phrases which translates directly from German to English states that they will have their satisfaction when they see Jewish blood spurt from the sword. Now this was a song, it can be documented proof, it was sung at the beginning of the Liberty Lobby's meetings. They stopped the practice very quickly, but uh, nevertheless it does exist, and if you read the publication, I'll tell you something, they've got a wonderful strategy. They put out a lot of very good information, but if you read it, please read between the lines when you're looking at this stuff. With anything, do that, but especially the spotlight. This is the exact quote that the spotlight uh, treated very carefully. We're going to give it to you now directly. Today, Americans, Henry Kissinger, by the way, today Americans would be outraged if UN forces entered Los Angeles to restore order. Tomorrow, they will be grateful. This is especially true if they were told that there was an outside threat from beyond, whether real or propagated, that threatened our very existence. It is then that all peoples of the world will plead with world leaders to deliver them from this evil. The one thing that every man fears is the unknown. When presented with this scenario, individual rights will be willingly relinquished in return for the guarantee of their well-being, granted to them by their new world government. Now, if you think we're kidding here, uh, I, can't, I can't convince you enough of, of what is about to happen if you don't do something about it. Uh, I'm going to give you another date. You might want to write about this. Tuesday evening, May 5th, uh, 1992, during the budget debates and conference in C-SPAN, it was shut off completely from your view. C-SPAN's making no comments about it at the time. Uh, the only thing that we've got in writing states that it was a boring budget meeting and they just thought they'd shut it down because nobody wanted to see it. <laughs> now, if you've ever watched C-SPAN, you know 95% is incredibly boring and I, you know, you'd want to shut it off most of the time. Uh, so that's not a great, that's not a great reason. Uh, okay, we're going to get off some of that kind of stuff right now. We've got several problems. I understand some of them may have been talked about this morning uh, with the economy and that kind of stuff. 
Uh, one of the biggest problems that we have coming up here is the BCCI scandal and the repercussions thereof. Now it's okay for George Bush and his family to take their losses out on you and your tax dollars, Neil uh, uh, and all the others, especially Neil with Silverado Savings and Loan. However, George Bush is prepared, and there are several ways that they will accomplish this. George Bush has signed into law what is known as Emergency Banking Regulation Number 1. And what that calls for is if the FDIC goes insolvent, or the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which, by the way, they tried to stop because they've merged the two largest banking industries, Security Pacific and Bank of America, together to try to carry them out for at least the end of this year so they don't have to admit this insolvency has taken place. Uh, this is about what's to happen. This is law, by the way. You can contact the Federal Reserve. You can contact uh, the White House. Tell them that you want to know how to, to get a hold of Executive Order Emergency Bank Regulation Number 1. If the President throws it into action, which it is signed into law now, all he has to do is pen his name to it. First thing that happens is immediate closure of all banks. Second, uh, second part of the law, seizing all personal bank accounts. Within a certain amount of time, Secret Service and their designated agents will go into your banks and they will check by writ of order, they will check through your safety deposit boxes for any precious metals, stones, uh, any tradable commodities that could be used. Third, restriction, uh, third, restricts the borrowing of capital, so you can't borrow money to replace what they've just grabbed from you. Fourth, they prohibit food and gasoline hoarding. Now that holds you as a hostage. Um, I'll give you another piece of inside information. They won't admit this to, by letter or to your face, but a division within FBI and another division within alcohol, tobacco, and firearms has been for the past year collecting information going back 10 years. If any one of you in this room has ordered storage foods to be stored from several different companies or ordered large quantities of uh, water purification pills or tablets, uh, anything along the line that they may deem you somebody that could be considered a survivalist, your name is being taken from the master lists. If the food company that you're ordering the food from has a computer system, it's too late. They've got your name. Part of the presentation I tomorrow, uh, I understand, is going to have to do with privacy. So I, I'm assured it's going to be very good. I would urge you to take uh, uh, very careful notes on that one. OK, very quickly. Uh, I want to read something here very quickly about the Bush family that we put together here. No president in recent history has had the, the blatant and unexplored familial contacts of interest found among the Bushes. George Brothers Prescott, Prescott Bush, a financial consultant, was paid 200000 by a Japanese real estate firm and another company, both with alleged links to the Japanese organized crime Yakuza. One of the interesting things is, Right after the Tiananmen Square massacre, George Bush granted China, China, not the Soviet Union who was trying to do our bidding and, and uh, put democracy through, what, weren't interested in helping them as we probably should have done back when we had the chance. They helped Tiananmen Square communist red Chinese that mowed down students with tanks. They gave them the favored nation trade status. Now something that you can write and find out information on or just call the White House opinion line if you have the guts and ask them if it's true if George Prescott Bush, uh, George's older brother, owns eight golf courses and seven hotels in mainland China. Ask them if he has an interest. Did anybody here, by the way, hear last week that a Denver oil drilling company just received US rights and Chinese approval to begin oil exploration in the Chinese Sea? Now, the interesting thing there is the sea that's in question is in dispute between the Chinese government and the Vietnamese government who got into a fighting war about this in 1973. Interestingly enough, 
China turned immediately around when Vietnam said, no, we will attack whatever U.S. oil exploration companies come, and we will blow their ships out of the water, exact quote. China said, no, you won't, because we will back them with the full strength of our naval power. China said this, they'll do it for us. Well, now you're starting to see the trade-off. That was a UPI story, by the way, and so far we haven't seen it appear in the LA Times, the New York Times. There was a very small piece in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the eldest son, George Jr., was on the board of directors of Harkin Oil when the little company landed a very lucrative oil production deal on the island of Bahrain, off the coast of Saudi Arabia. Interestingly enough, it, the oil deal was landed just two weeks before Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. George Jr. sold more than 200,000 shares of Harkin stock, but didn't report the insider stock sale until March of 1991, eight months after the federal deadline for disclosing such transactions legally. This goes on. Uh, I don't want to go into more detail. We've got something on every avenue of the Bush family. Perot has been accused recently of investigating the Bushes. He said it's not true. If he did it, I say credit to him. Uh, if ever there was a family, the government answers to us, first of all. When Major Dean made the comment that we're in violation of national security, and I said back, no, we're not, the fact of the matter is, and uh, granted, we probably have differing opinions on it, but the fact of the matter is, if you're in the military, if you've been in the military, you realize that you took an oath of office to protect and to defend the United States Constitution, and that's exactly what we owe to this government. It's what, because the government is us. That's why we owe it to us. Now, the group that I am affiliated with, uh, some people have asked me why I've bothered. Everything that's going wrong in this country can be corrected. It can be corrected quickly. But they're going to try to maintain a stranglehold, and they're doing it slowly through manipulation of you, uh, in the law, in the press, in everything that's taking place. We are coming to a point in history where you are not going to regret being here because you're going to see the most exciting things take place ever in the world's history. Uh, and we say that with absolute uh, <coughs> conviction. One of the things you have to worry about, and this was taken from uh, Oddly enough, the Antelope Valley Press, Friday, March 6, 1992. Government wiretap needs could force higher public phone bills. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about this, it's a system that is called, for lack of a better word, remote. And it's done by remote observation from a telephone. They don't need to get into your house to tap you anymore. I assure you this is true. They can do it from another state. They can do it from up there. They can do it from underground. All they need is your name and your telephone number. There is no way that even these people are aware of to properly detect this tap because it absolutely gives no wattage regulation on the line. There, there's a controlled wattage regulation. It feeds into the line directly. They can't trace it back to any source. Intelligence agencies are now using it. What this article is about is the FBI is acting like spoiled children, and they're very upset that they can't have it right now. The FBI has decreased its domestic, all the FBI, 30% of the FBI's force had to do with Soviet and communist bloc intelligence and the collection thereof. Um, the interesting thing is the FBI's role did not decrease, it recently increased. The 30% were brought back home, and an additional staff of 3,000 was hired for just domestic surveillance in the United States. Now, we don't know what the problem with that is. Uh, you, we want you to figure out what the problem with that is. Uh, not everybody from the FBI is bad. We've had a lot of people that are ex-FBI, we've got one coming tomorrow, that uh, had a few things to say about what he, <coughs> what he thinks about all this, and I urge you to listen to him. What Norio was basically talking about when he introduced me, the COM12 and the Aquarius group, uh, what I'm going to offer to you now, because I don't want to get into it in detail, we promise you, uh, if you have patience, we'll take care of it. Within a week from now, I will be giving Gary or Norio or both of them a list 
of about 500 different section documents that you can inquire about, which will prove beyond the shadow of a doubt to you with government documentation, we will tell you how to request it under the FOIA Act, that over 3,000 top Nazi officers were shipped into this country. If you read the flyer that we sent out, uh, you may have a hint of what we're getting at here. Were shipped into this country by one of Hitler's top spies in the business for the East Bloc. The deal was made because the Nazis knew so much about what the East Bloc Russians were doing, they could easily come over, be incorporated into the United States, and with the help of Henry Kissinger and Zygmunt Brzezinski, who happened to work for the 907th, uh, it's an intelligence group in the United States Army that Kissinger worked for at the time. They were responsible for bringing the Nazis over here. Reinhard Galen is the name of the Nazi uh, general that was in charge of this process. The CIA hid them. They put them in power. The Aquarius group that was mentioned earlier is a fascist wing of this group in the government. They are known as Aquarius. They've been growing in the government uh, as time has gone on. I'm going to read you a memorandum for the president, 25 June 1945. The following information transmitted by the OSS representative in Caserta on 21 June was obtained from a French agent in the Schinker Sicherheitsdienst SD, the SS Security Service. Source declares that he attended a conference at Dysenhofen Sieg near Munich in mid-April 1945, which was presided by an S over by an SS Obergruppenführer whom he did not know. The latter indicated that AMT-3B, internal SD, or Sicherheitsdienst, and AMT-4, Gestapo, of the Reich Sicherheitsdienst Hauptmacht, or the RSHA, the Reich's chief security office under Hitler's regime has been merged to promote post-war unrest. Trustworthy men, the SS Opengruppenführer said already have been sent to live in Spain and Switzerland to handle distribution of monies for this conversion. The program will involve the organization of nationalistic movements under the guise of an anti-Bolshevist front and should culminate in civil warfare. The program would be designed to complicate the Allied post-war task and to permit the Nazis to reappear eventually in a suitable disguise in order to create a Fourth Reich. Signed, G. Edward Buxton, Acting Director, Office of Strategic Services, OSS Report to President Truman. This was taken from the archives of papers of Harry S. Truman, White House Central Files, Office of Strategic Services, Harry S. Truman Library. If you'd like this document, as well as many more, about this subject and how we help them, give the name to Gary or Norio. We will send you out, uh, at our expense, a file of documents that is probably good, close to 3 quarters of an inch thick, that will give you all of the FOIA requests that you need to make to get all of these documents firsthand that we've been able to obtain. Um, Part of the subject for the special guest speaker that we were going to speak of tonight is UFOs, and I'm going to get to that very quickly. But before I leave this overall subject that we've been on so far, uh, I want to do two things. And uh, one of them is this document, which has actually been around for quite some time, but interestingly enough, it's come to the forefront once again. And it's the United States Department of Justice Federal Bureau of Investigation Special Agent in Charge Concentration Camp Program. Uh, United States Department of Defense, Master Search Warrant Number One, Master Search Warrant Number Two. Um, it's a spooky thing, and I'm not going to read the whole document, but I do want to read you some of the best of it here. It states that you will be taken prisoner under the federal emergency, whatever emergency it is. Now, remember the fact when we start talking later that I said federal emergency. It just depends on what your definition, again, your interpretation of a federal emergency is. Uh, as set forth in the regulation issued pursuant thereto, what is illegal when this document goes into effect is as follows. Firearms, weapons, or implements of war or component parts thereof, ammunition, bombs, explosives, or material used in the manufacture of explosives, shortwave radio receiving units. Uh, 
transmitting sets, signal devices, codes or ciphers, cameras, means for promoting biological warfare, radioactive materials, atomic devices or component parts thereof, propaganda material of the enemy or domestic insurgents, propaganda material which fosters, encourages, or promotes the policies, programs, or objectives of the enemy or its insurgents, printing presses, mimeograph machines, Xerox machines, or any other type of reproducing media on which any type of material that the government has deemed propaganda or aforementioned has been or is currently being prepared. Records including membership and financial records of groups or organizations or groups that have been declared subversive or say hereafter be declared subversive, they've left themselves open, by the Attorney General of the United States. This is straight from the Stalinist laws of the 30s, straight from the penal code that sent them to the Gulag Islands. And you heard it firsthand. Uh, just a second. Um, whole families? Yes, cameras. Any kind of cameras. I'll tell you something. If this law was in effect tonight and we were meeting doing the same thing here, You'd have whistles, you'd hear sirens, and every one of us, like the Jewish people before us, would be streaking from this room running for our lives. If you think I'm kidding, go ahead and do nothing about any of this that you're hearing. Now, I've got, I'm going to bring something up very quickly. I, I don't want to touch on this too much. This is a scary document. It's very real. Tape recorders, anything that you can record, yes. And it, I'll give you, well, I'll, let me do this. <laughs> okay, let's get into this just very quickly. Cash funds, either in currency or coin, promissory notes or checks, securities of any nature, papers, documents, writings, code books, signal books, sketches, photographs, photographic negatives, blueprints, plans, maps, models, instruments, appliances, graphic representations, papers, documents, or books of which there may be. Now listen to this, you'll love this. Invisible writing <laughs> relating to or concerning any military, naval, or air post, camp, station, or installation, or equipment for any arms, ammunition, blah, blah, blah. What it's basically saying is if you dare tell a neighbor in any written form, if you dare try to play uh, uh, charades and get caught in your living room trying to warn somebody that there's a camp in your neighborhood being set up, you're going to be taken. All this needs, by the way, uh, it needs the signature of the president and it needs the signature of the United States Attorney General. Who wrote that document? This document was actually written back in the 60s. Um, Is it called? It's called the United States Department of Justice Federal Bureau of Investigation Concentration camp program. Attention, special agent in charge. Uh, you don't. <laughs> well, it hasn't been implemented yet. That's why we're here tonight. Well, the documents themselves say five. But if you turn 20 pages back, it says, at any time that we see necessary, we'll designate it for 10 years. And it strikes out the clause that was written earlier in the book that says five. Uh, as I'm sure you know, everybody's probably heard about this by now, it's old news, House Joint Resolution 438 that uh, completely repeals the Second Amendment to the Constitution, the right to bear arms. Uh, this is currently up for, uh, up for vote. Uh, I'm going to very quickly go over this. If you want to see me afterwards or sometime tomorrow, I'll be around. I'll give you this list. I don't want to repeat it slowly here tonight. Uh, this is a basically domestic suspect relocation camp current status that was issued February 15, 1991, attention specialized divisions. Number one, Oakdale, California. Number two, Vandenberg, California. Number three, Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Number four, Fort Chafee, Arkansas. Fort McKay, Wisconsin. Fort Drum, New York. Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. Fort A.P. Hill, Virginia. Fort Benning, Georgia. Elgin Air Force Base. Uh, and another station that's unknown in Miami, Florida. Eleven bases have currently been designated as concentration relocation camps. Uh, 
you may have heard some reports of pilots recently, depending on what you listen to and what kind of press you read, about people making flights over vast areas of the desert in Nevada and Arizona and seeing chain link fences being put up overnight. And the same pilots, and I'm talking not military pilots, I'm talking American Airlines, uh, Southwest, are saying that they can't believe at the, the expanse that these chain link fences are being put up in the middle of nowhere and Quonset huts being erected. And the strange thing is they'll fly over a week later on another route and they'll all of a sudden find out that all the chain link has been wrapped in many strands of razor wire before they had flown over it the last time and it wasn't there. Uh, these are things that, you know, I hate to say you have to look forward to, but that's the way we look at it because it's going to solve a lot of problems. It's going to take care of a lot of situations. Now, I'm going to say something tonight uh, that we weren't planning on saying, but they've been a pain in the ass all day. And uh, I was hoping they'd stay, but they didn't. When Major Dean uh, made his, his remark earlier about who was here, there were also four other individuals who were here. Some of you may have heard them today. I wasn't planning on getting into this, but uh, I can't help it. Uh, tomorrow, there is going to be a lot of furor going on in these hallways. It's going to be connected to Colin Brown. It's going to be connected to Ted Gunderson. If you'd like to talk to me about what it is, I would love to talk to each and every one of you, but I don't want to do it right now, right here, because I kind of want to see what the fireworks are going to be like tomorrow. Um, there were people that were taking key parts of recordings from this, this thing all day. Uh, we were aware of what was going on. I was kind of hoping they'd stick around, but they did not. Uh, I would hope that they won't come back tomorrow, but in a way, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm very tempted to tell you exactly what it is right now, but I don't want to waste valuable time on worthless people. Um, <laughs> Okay, 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 I'll make, I'll, I'll make this agreement, I'll make this agreement. I'm not going to give the name, okay? But I assure you they've paid, and if they've paid, they're going to be here tomorrow, okay? The man that was here was here with a couple of friends. Uh, I'm glad they're his friends, not mine. And I'll tell you something, we've made a landmark... Uh, move here today. Because as I told Gary and as I told Norio earlier today, you know, if we've got them showing up in person and not their henchmen, they've got to be genuinely worried for their own asses. They've got to be genuinely worried that we're about to put the noose on their neck. Now things got a little tight in here when I started talking about actual government documentation that they could hear, see, and read about. They don't want to hear that. They want to stand in the line at the buffet and badmouth everybody and uh, talk about how they disagree with this and they disagree with that and we're all badly misinformed. Well, I'll tell you something. We've got the proof of what we're talking about with this situation. The gentleman that's here's father is in jail right now for the murder for hire of Fred Alvarez, the Indian tribal chief of the Cabazon Reservation out near Palm Springs and two associates at their home in Rancho Mirage. There is a district attorney investigator by the name of Gene Gilbert. I'm, I didn't want to get onto this, but you forced me. Uh, <laughs> by the name of Gene Gilbert, who currently is running and hiding. Call up the Riverside District Attorney's Office and ask him if this isn't true. Currently running and hiding because he's afraid of certain people and their friends. One of those people was here tonight. He is currently running the show for his dad who is now in jail for murder for hire. Interestingly enough, somebody that I put up to it went up and tried to strike a conversation this morning and ask him about some names that we're very interested in, such as car bombing deaths in Arizona that he's been linked to, and a few other things. And he told the person not to worry that they were suffering from post-mortem depression. <laughs> now, uh, I promised a couple people I wasn't going to say anything about this, but I could not resist. Uh, these people are the people that have the elitist attitude to 
do what they're doing privately, working with the black teams and the secret element of the government that's in the military industrial complex, and they're using it to their advantage. They're getting illegal things thrown through left and right, and then they sit here in total ignorance and arrogance because they're too heavily involved to say, geez, you know, maybe, maybe all this stuff that we're doing isn't so good. Maybe all of it isn't completely illegal. They like to think differently. Um, Mr. Brown will be giving you more details on this tomorrow, and Mr. Gunderson, so I don't want to step on, on their shoes. Um, the gentleman is now running the Cabazon Venture. Uh, he was here and laughed at all you idiots here all day. He made comments about who was here. Uh, they really stared at a few of you more than others. Um, we constantly had stare debates back and forth in the hallway. Uh, as far as I'm considered, it's, it's good old clean fun. But uh, I, if tomorrow, if you would like me to point the individual out, yeah. 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 Uh, if it hasn't happened by the time Ted Gunderson is finished, and he's still, the individual and his people are still here, I'd be more than happy to do that for you. Okay? Yeah. Uh, see, the, the situation is this. I couldn't do this if I didn't have people behind me. There is a form of the government now. Right now, it's not a form that has a whole hell of a lot to do with anything. But unfortunately, the thing is this. You've got your sons, you've got your daughters, you've got your grandkids, you've got your brothers, you've got your sisters in the United States Armed Services. They cannot conduct the illegal government that they want to with our family. They've got to take the United Nations to do it if they have their way. It would be very nice to have a one world order where it was a true republic, we could all make free choices, uh, freedom of religion, freedom to do what you want, practice religion. Uh, two of their plans that you may have heard about in the past is the King Alfred plan, which Oliver North so quickly gave up and told all of us, uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to run a short tape tomorrow where he talks about Rex Bravo 84, Rex 84 Bravo. Rex 84 Bravo was a contingency to declare martial law in the United States. And when Congressman Hamilton asked him about it at length, North looked him right in the eye, sitting there disgustingly in the uniform of the United States Lieutenant Colonel Marine. And he said, Congressman, Senator, excuse me, if you, want, if you insist that I divulge the information on this plan, martial law will be declared by tomorrow morning. It ran on all the television cameras. It ran on the radio. Many people here may have heard the statement that was made. Senator Inouye slammed his gavel down six times and said, we will have no more of that. We will have that addressed in a private session at a later date. Now that's a problem, because if you look back into what the document was, Rex Bravo, Rex, the Latin name for king, the second contingency in a series of contingencies, the first one being named King Alfred. King Alfred has been revitalized. I don't want to get into big details, but the Rodney King situation has caused it to be revitalized. The American Indian, uh, Americans, the American black, the American Hispanic, has constantly been put in the position of a struggling peoples with the government that they have in power right now. Without going into great details, King Alfred planned, Rex Bravo being the successor, King Alfred called for the immediate encampment through a series of incidents to take place for all black Americans. Hispanic was to take place second. Now, as, as they said in Germany, when they called for the Jews, I did nothing. When they called for the Catholics, I did nothing, blah, blah, blah. When they came to get me, there was no one left to fight for me. We're all in this together. We've got to do something about it together. The point of the whole thing here is the United States military 
certain groups within the military have known about this problem, have identified the problem, have identified the enemy, but we have a problem. The problem is this. These groups are very powerful. They come in all branches, all service, all shapes, all sizes. If we were to step up and do something overnight in this situation, it would be completely illegal. And we don't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. Because nobody in the streets is telling us that it's about time that something took place. It's about time that the Constitution be restored. I urge all of you tomorrow, the document that's pinned to the back of the wall in the room is called the reaffirmation of the Constitution. If you'd like a copy, we can see about getting you one. We can't do it for everybody, but at least please go read it. Um, it changes a lot of things that have taken place and puts things back that they have amended out. If we don't do something soon, if you don't do something soon, this is going to happen to you overnight, and our war is going to take place anyway. We need your help. Can you give a time frame in your opinion? By 95. Uh, we've got a situation right now that's increasingly very fragile every day. We had an incident last month where security services on one side of the fence had a problem with some other security services at a site, a domestic site here in the U.S., and there was a standoff. And it actually, there's tension. There's tension building up. Everybody can feel it in the air. Nothing, we do not want to take any action. There can be no action taken until we see that the populace is sick and tired of what is going on and does something about this entire situation. If we did anything before that, we should all be taken away on a train and arrested because we have no right to do it until you, the people, we, the people, say it's time to do something. The forces are there. Uh, what I solutions. Now this is going to sound kind of funny, but if you'd like to help us out, we don't need your money. We would like your support. You hear about us in the future in the newspaper. At least you got the truth here first before we're in camp. <laughs> this flag hanging over my left shoulder, some of you may recognize, some of you may not. It's called the Gatson flag. And uh, Commodore Essex Hopkins of Rhode Island was the first commander in chief of the Navy other than John Paul Jones. The rattlesnake figure was used quite predominantly in the American Revolution, and it was taken as a sign because the rattlesnake was very deadly if it was disturbed. If it was allowed to rest and have its life free to reign and not be disturbed and not have its rights tread upon, then you had no danger from the rattlesnake. However, if you stepped near the ground, the rattle immediately sounded and a warning was given. A warning was given to stay away. Uh, it's a perfect symbol. It's a perfect symbol. Uh, it's, it's interesting. It's the Navy Commander-in-Chief's flag from the Revolutionary War. The name was given by Colonel Christopher Gadsden. It was named after him who was so impressed with the flag that he had a copy of it made for the legislature of his home state. The flag has since then been referred to as the Gadsden flag. Uh, South Carolina. Uh, the interesting thing about it is this is our philosophy in a perfect three by five size. What we would like you to do is call a flag company. Uh, they're listed all over the United States in your yellow pages. If you would like to make a 25 to $30 investment, purchase a Gadsden flag. And every time there's a flag day or a holiday that this nation celebrates, <laughs> hang that alongside your American flag as a favor to us if you really want to do something about it. When somebody asks you, why are you hanging the weird flag out? Uh, what we'd like you to do is inform them about the history of the flag, what it means. Don't tread on me. It's a warning to the government. It's a warning to the false government, because we are the government. It's a warning to the people that are in charge of everything right now. Right on. The people that are here that took recordings uh, the people from the Cabazon place, the gentleman that Mr. Dean mentioned, uh, the problem is they're worried. 
if they're not sending the Goonies in to find out what's going on, the, the, the biggest compliment to us is that they're coming themselves. They're worried about this kind of a movement. The rattlesnake warns before he bites. The warnings are out. If we see enough people getting behind an issue, we're going to start promoting this a little bit more. We have something that we're working quietly with uh, For the People, Chuck Harder's group. He has no idea what's, what's causing it. <laughs> but we've sent the suggestion to him to do the same, and so far he's responded very well. This flag is the perfect symbol that needs to be flown again in a revolutionary time, a time to change things, a time to get rid of idiots that would put things in like King Alfred, Rex Bravo. Uh, the tape that we'll be showing tomorrow will be talking about this. There's a tape, Rex 84, King Alfred, and Jonestown, uh, which Dave Emery did, if you're familiar with Mr. Emery, uh, very good uh, that was done. Uh, it's over there available for sale. Very quickly, I want to give you one last thing on the recording uh, before we get into a UFO topic for five minutes. Uh, the following recording was a recorded conversation by Dennis Bernstein, who is of Friendly Forces, and Daniel Childs, who is the ex-treasurer to the Central Intelligence Agency. Now the man, he knew the phone call was being recorded, so you've got to listen to the stress in his voice as he's being asked questions about, isn't it kind of strange that the ex-treasurer for the CIA has been appointed to investigate the BCCI scandal and if the CIA was involved with it? <laughs> <laughs> and you can hear the... Go ahead, Steve. Notice the stress in the voice of the man that's being questioned. His name is Daniel Childs. It is just absolutely repulsive. Uh, yeah, well, Colonel North stated that it was going to happen if that had not been stopped. Well, in my opinion, all that did was uh, rally the rats back into the sewers and hide until they can surface their heads again. Well, Michael, so you're, what you're saying is that you interpret because we are... No, sir, I am bring legislation here that, according to you, Professor Shimerinsky and a few other people waves the fourth and eighth right amendments to the Constitution that we are attempting to do that. Now that is your interpretation. We are establishing a priority concern of ours, that of addressing the fact that we have people out there in the streets who are being victimized through drug trafficking and other crimes. Congressman, we need you need to address that. Congressman, we you feel that it's a priority for us to address that. Congressman, you've repeatedly used the word interpretation to characterize my arguments. The bill in its text says federal courts cannot find prison conditions to be cruel and unusual punishment unless there are alternatives. The bill in its text says that you cannot suppress evidence in federal court if the police officers acted in good faith. That's not an interpretation. That's in the text of the bill. And that blatantly runs afoul of the Constitution and Supreme Court opinions. And no matter how important the need that you characterize, it doesn't justify doing away with the Constitution. Well, There's no evidence that would help fight the drug problem to begin with. We, we heard from somebody that uh, you were a former, uh, an employee of the Central Intelligence Agency. Is that true, Mr. Childs? That's correct. And were you the former controller for the CIA? That's correct. Now, is it also true that when you testified uh, at a Senate committee regarding uh, funds that went for the Contras, you didn't, you, you expressed, and I'm referring to uh, a passage from a book, Veil, vale, by Robert, uh, Bob Woodward, that you didn't, you weren't very concerned with the amount of money that was going off the shelf to the Contras. Uh, was that, is that the case? Uh, well, you've got a lot of your facts wrong. Could you, could you inform us? And the and the comments in the Veil book were taken out of context. I see. Do you think that there might be a conflict of interest, uh, you being a former employee of the, of the CIA and, in fact, being the money person, the comptroller for the Central Intelligence Agency? Not at all. You don't think that that might get in the way of your investigation into the CIA's connection with SNLs? Not at all. I'm not personally investigating it. I have two, three uh, lawyers who are doing the actual investigation. But you are, you, are the, you are the staff director. That's uh, correct. And so you're in charge of that investigation, am I correct? That's correct. And, and you are a former employee of the Central Intelligence Agency. I'm, I'm sorry, what was the last question? And you are a former employee of the Central Intelligence Agency. Yeah, I'm a former employee of the Central Intelligence Agency, that's correct. Are you, do you still work for the agency? No, I uh -huh. resigned. Uh-huh. 
Um, and uh, could you clarify, uh, because if we have our facts straight and we took the Woodward thing out of context, could you explain to us uh, uh, the comments regarding uh, the Contras? Did you oppose that kind of off-the-shelf operation? Did you testify that uh, you felt that that was the wrong thing to I be about? About any off-the-shelf operation. Ex in other words... Not an issue of any off-the-shelf operation. Well, were you uh, opposed to the covert support of the Contras, say, by third-party countries or um, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the ways in which uh, Oliver North solicited money from... It wasn't an issue that I was involved in. Uh -huh. would, would you oppose something like that? Of course. Uh -huh. And uh, now we understand that there's new legislation uh, that's come down from the Senate that, uh, as far as our information goes, uh, makes it more difficult or, or, or frees up intelligence agencies to, um, to, uh, do, to do more uh, uh, operations that have to do with, uh, with intelligence, that it allows the president to, uh, um, to use uh, various federal employees that aren't typically used for intelligence operations to, be, to get involved in such things. Is that the case? It depends on your point of view. Uh-huh. Well, well, what's your point of view on that? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that there is already authority to undertake covert action activities, uh -huh. explicit in existing law. Uh -huh. This makes it explicit, uh, as well as provides uh, clear safeguards and oversight uh, provisions of those kinds of activities. So in my personal uh, from my personal perspective, uh, I think it's a step forward. Uh -huh. uh, some people are concerned that this takes the Congress out from in between the executive branch and the intelligence agencies, and it allows the president to, by virtue of a finding, to operate outside the, if you will, outside... I can't follow the conversation. You're fading out. Okay, well, let me see if I can be more clear. Can you hear me now, Mr. Childs? Yeah. Um, some people are concerned that uh, this legislation takes the Congress out from inside, in between the president, the, the, the president and the intelligence community. And by virtue of a finding, it allows the president to act outside, if you will, the, uh, the knowledge of the people as they are represented in Congress. No, I don't see how people come to that conclusion, but uh, I don't think this legislation does that. Uh-huh. Uh, all right. Well, we want to thank you, uh, Mr. Childs. Uh, I want to thank you for talking to me. And uh... He doesn't even say goodbye. He just hung up immediately. Uh, just very quickly before we touch the UFO topic, uh, the thing that he was referring to is we already have the approval to do what we want to do without, the pre without anybody's approval here. Uh, it's this conference report to Senate Bill 2834 from 1991. Let me read you just one key portion. Nothing contained in the, con in the area of this title shall be construed as requiring the approval of the intelligence committees, the Congress and the Senate, as a condition precedent to the initiation of such activities. Meaning we need no approval to do what we need to do to get the job done. Uh, the president shall ensure. Now, put George Bush in this position as you know him to be the president currently and say that you can safely trust, yourself when, uh, trust him when you go to sleep tonight to ensure this. The president shall ensure that any illegal intelligence activity is immediately reported promptly to the intelligence committees, the same committee that they don't have to tell to do the operation in the first place. But if they do something that's illegal, the president has to ensure that immediately they're going to come tattle on themselves. <laughs>